So it's great to welcome Rob back into the store again. This is Rob Buckland here, our special guest today. Um, previously, you may have seen a video where we ran down all of the key classical mouthpieces known to classical saxophone players, and it was a really interesting insight that he gave us into all of these mouthpieces. But now we're just going to talk a little bit more generally about, well, firstly, the, the sort of the art of the crossover saxophone player, because Rob is that man, he can do that stuff very well. And we don't often have these kind of players in our store to, um, you know, to sort of glean this information. So it's just such a great opportunity uh, to get the expertise of someone like Rob and have this kind of conversation. Um, so, you know, well, thanks first of all for coming down and absolutely. taking this time to, to be with us. So it sounded absolutely fantastic. Um, You're playing earlier, going through all these mouthpieces. And, uh, and what was interesting is that you, we decided to take an interesting tack here where you picked a few mouthpieces and you played the same mouthpiece, but in a classical style and in a jazz style, um, I suppose to, to show that, well, what does it show? Does it show that uh, it's, it's ultimately about the player? You have to design the sound in your head uh, and the mouthpiece can ultimately move in different directions, but perhaps some mouthpieces are less suitable for moving into both directions or you know than other mouthpieces is, yeah is, is, i think that the end game here i, th I think so um, i was very looking back quite lucky uh when i started off playing in that i was playing clarinet in the school wind band and i got to play saxophone in the school big band and i ended up doing some jazz and classical at the same time and i had a classical clarinet teacher and a jazz saxophone teacher and somewhere along the way, the whole thing just sort of got a bit soupy and mixed up. And I sort of figured out that when I'm in this situation, this is how you behave when you're in this situation. This is these are the sounds that are expected of you. And then started to notice that the guys next to me in the big band, all the kind of grown up guys were playing on different mouthpieces yeah. and that sounded cooler. And you'd try that out and figure out what that was. Yeah. And so it, it, it sort of, it's, it's always, been part of my journey as a, as a musician. What I'm trying to do with the saxophone is to figure out how I can bring the best of those two worlds together. I always found the classical saxophone world in a box on its own, yeah. couldn't deliver everything I wanted out of my relationship with the instrument. And the jazz saxophone world, and I hate those two terms being distinctive because yeah. it's just a sliding scale. Yeah. Um, had so many more exciting things involved in it, but I felt that there were things that the classical world was asking me to do that could somehow be brought into the two. Mm. And so I, I'm trying to find a way to, to bring all of the color and variety and nuance and almost uh, incorrectness perhaps of, of some of the sounds you hear in a jazz world, the slightly out of tune, yeah. bending a note into tune, uh, an airy, breathy sound rather yeah. than a pure sound, all of yeah. those things that yeah. make it sound very human and very attractive. Yeah. Trying to find a way to bring those into a classical world with respect yeah. so, so that the instrument perhaps has more color to it than, than the, the absolute pure classical saxophone tradition yeah. of old, which I think is we're sort of moving away from anyway. You, how can you be a saxophone player in 2023 and ignore the impact that the jazz has had on the instrument? Absolutely. And how can you ignore the impact that the classical can? Yeah. And the, you know, the, the, the things that the composers are writing for us to do on the instrument now mm. are so demanding. Yeah. It's pushed the instrument so far yeah. forward. And then I think that's had an impact. You, you know, you talk to some of the great classical players of our time yeah. and the great jazz players and everybody's doing each other's disciplines. You talk yeah. to the jazz players and they're all, you know, look at Branford, he, he's a fantastic classical yeah. player. You look at all of those guys, all practice. I talked to Bob Minster about this. He said, oh, mm. I practice my bark on the saxophone, yeah. you know. So it, it just becomes music. Yeah. It's a saxophone. And then the way that you operate it 
is dictated to by the environment that you find yourself mm -hmm. in, which is where we come into our mouthpiece discussion that we had earlier. Yeah. How can you set the instrument up so that it feels like it's enabling you to do the job that you're trying to do, mm -hmm. rather than I have a classical mouthpiece yes. and a jazz mouthpiece? Yeah. Yeah. And I regularly carry four, five, six mouthpieces in my case at any one time yeah. and, uh, of, of, of classical mouthpieces. I'm sitting in an orchestra, I won't just go in with the one I've got on yeah. because I might need to tailor what I'm doing so that it feels, so that I feel better when mm. I'm playing it. That's it. really interesting. Uh, you mentioned that to me about an hour ago before we went to camera and I find that a, a, a more unusual position to be in because the normal recommendation to people as they, you know, become more experienced players and, and uh, and they're trying to move through their careers and what have you, is stop mucking around with the gear, find the mouthpiece that works and just practice and become a great musician. Don't get distracted by the gear. But I think it, your example here is slightly different because you know, you're playing at a high professional level and you're able to hop from one mouthpiece to another in, in these sort of maybe pressurized performing situations whereby there might be the demand to um, concentrate on playing really dark and really quiet and with real control and you know that if you move from one mouthpiece to another you can do that and I suppose you just know all your mouthpieces like the back of your hand so that you're able to yeah to you know manu maneuver between the mouthpieces which isn't something you necessarily maybe recommend to a less experienced player no not at all I mean you've got to you've got to find your thing first I think you've got to find a core sound and a way that you can make the instrument work but then when we get to the, the top end of what's expected musically, there's so many subtle nuances in what's, what makes a performance the difference between something that's really right for the job or quite right for the job. Mm. And, you know, we all want to make our, the, the sound we make absolutely perfect for yeah. the situation that we find ourselves yeah. in. And so I'm not, let me be clear, I'm not suggesting that you have hundreds and hundreds of mouthpieces, yeah. you're changing them all the time. But, you know, if I'm preparing to do an orchestral concert and there's uh, and I look at what's in the program if we've got West Side Story symphonic dances and we've yeah. got um, uh, the old castle picture and exhibition are in the yeah. same thing then yeah. I can play on the same mouthpiece mm. but maybe depending on the way the rest of the orchestra is playing yeah. maybe you know if, if the if the lead trumpet's brought in as a screen trumpet player in West Side Story mm. rather than the principal trumpet of the orchestra yeah. that will change the way that I should play within the orchestra yeah. as well and maybe I can brighten that up with a mouthpiece that just yeah. gives it that little extra sizzle yeah. then I will make that change but most of the time I will have my go-to classical setup on my yeah. go-to jazz setup yeah. it's just there are some specific mm. areas around that where sometimes mm. you can blur the edges <laughs> It's That's much, much harder for a, a, a player who's been trained to play with a jazz embouchure to then develop the extra strength that's needed to mm. control a classical mouthpiece. Yeah. But that's only because you have to use more muscular strength. And it's exactly the same as if you go to the gym and you bench press 20K, 20 kilograms, and suddenly somebody gives you 50, mm. you don't have the muscular strength to do yeah. it. The technique's the same, yeah, yeah, but yeah. you don't have the muscular strength. But if you're used to bench pressing 50K and somebody mm. gives you 20, you can do it. Yeah. So it's the same thing in reverse. It's just to do with muscular strength. Yeah. And all of these, the way that we play the saxophone in whatever context, if you look at it in its purest form, it's about you chucking air towards the tip of the mouthpiece mm. and manipulating it before it starts making a sound. And it starts making a sound at the tip of the mouthpiece, mm. which is inside your face. So your embouchure is in the past in terms of where the sound is, yeah, yeah, yeah. actually. Yeah. So by the time it gets to embouchures moving around, we're already manipulating a sound that started. So, yeah. so much of the work is done beforehand. Right. If I've got a tongue and some lips and some lungs, and you've got a tongue and some lips and some lungs, and you put yours in the same position as mine, it will make the same sound and vice versa. Yeah. If you understand what that is, and if you have enough strength in those muscles because you use them regularly, mm. you would be able to develop a, very quickly a, a classical embouchure, an yeah. embouchure that can cope with a more resistant setup, is what yeah. we're basically saying. Yeah. And therefore that delivers 
uh, less variety in the sound. Mm. And that's what the mouthpiece is supposed to do. Mm. A classical mouthpiece, I describe it like this to, when I'm talking to students a lot of the time, yeah. it's like a butler. It wanders around behind you, sweeping up to make you make everything neat and tidy. Even if you're playing a little bit, yeah. if you're moving things around, it just tidies yeah, them up anyway. That's a really I can't great know, whereas, whereas the jazz mouthpiece is this, designed to have, so if you do yeah. a little bit yeah. of movement, it goes, oh no, I'll yeah. make that look amazing. Yeah. And its job you is to bend amplify. And it's all over the place. It all amplifies the any small movements yeah. and the other one Re sort of refines, uh, refines them. The focus, them. Yeah. And so much as if you were if you were setting up a Formula One car to drive around the streets of Monaco, you set it up differently than if you're driving around Monza and it's all yeah. straight. It's the same car, yeah. but you set the aero differently and you make yeah. it react differently in the situation that you're in. And it's yeah. just that. I did a couple of clips uh, that obviously will be in this video somewhere where I play my a uh, classical setup, and I play the solo from the old castle, mm. pictured exhibition, properly classical. And then I put my Mayer jazz mouthpiece yeah. that I use for lead alto and big band stuff. And I try and play the same solo and make it sound as classical as I can possibly make mm. it, even though it's a seventh star, you know. Yeah. And you, you know, you can tell it isn't the same thing, but yeah. actually, you can control that mouthpiece. Yeah, broadly speaking, it's and like make it behave. Ninety-five. Yeah, it's now. close enough that you might not get yeah. fired. And yeah. then, <laughs> and then I'd play some sort of generic cheesy uh, uh, jazz pop blue scale pop yeah. thing on the mayor. Yeah. And then do the same thing on the classical yeah. mouthpiece. And whilst it isn't, it doesn't have all that excitement in yeah. it. You can get close. Yeah. And that sort of proves my point that that. Let's say 75% of it is yeah. what you do to that sound yeah. before it goes in the instrument. Yeah. And then if you can set the instrument up to either refine or yeah. amplify, yeah. then I think you're going to get a good balance and then you're going to feel like you're making the right sound in yeah. the environment. Yeah. And that's something that's always sort of fueled me. I, I, yeah. I never liked that thing about what well, you've been trained as a classical player, so you can't play yeah. jazz. No, I agree. I, I hate found these. it very frustrating. And it's brilliant. the same thing with saxophones. Um, Jamie and I and all our colleagues talk about this all the time. People come in, I'm looking for a jazz saxophone, OK? Yes, that would be exactly. one of the saxophones here, any of them behind yes. us. I'm looking for a classical saxophone. That would be one of, and I think it's, it's maybe a mistake that the sort of manufacturers fall into. They're looking to how to market something. Oh, I think this is a classical bore. No, it's a bore of yeah, a saxophone, exactly. and you can do anything on it. It might lean in certain directions, but it's, there's so much crossover. Well, as we found earlier, you know, testing out those however many mouthpieces yeah. that was, you start off playing them and you go, oh, this is different, this is yeah. different. And then by the end of it, you've started to go, oh, I've got it now. I can make it do. That's the sound I hear in my head. I can yeah. make it do that. Yeah. And I bet if you listen to the end of all those yeah. takes, I would sound more like me than I did at the beginning. Yeah. And I think ultimately this is the you thing did. we're left with. I, can, I sound I like me <laughs> and you sound like yeah. you and Josh Redman sounds like Joshua yeah. Redman and Chris Potter sounds like Chris Potter and Vance David sounds like... And you've, you, it doesn't, you find something yeah. that enables you to say who you yeah. are and what it's you're trying to do. It's a tool ultimately and yeah. we are And there's a be choice ourselves. then about whether you then amplify the, 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 the fun, the jazz yeah. side that, that or whether you purify that up yeah. and you make that choice just to help you sound even better. Yeah, agreed. I think that that rounds off the discussion absolutely perfectly there. So we are going to leave it at that. We're going to call this a wrap. It's been fabulous talking to you, Rob. So thanks again Brilliant. Thanks for, for coming me down in. and we shall see you again in the future. I sincerely hope so. Thanks, guys.